the soul world, its hells, heavens, and evolutions. Roll aside the curtains of materiality, penetrate through the mists and darkness of ignorance that skirt the passageway between the two worlds, go beyond the doubts and mutations of material thought and enter into the radiant light of the soul world that lies beyond. And in that fairier country, journey with us, and to some extent, inspect its hells, its heavens, and comprehend in some degree the evolutions that are possible there to that life itself as well as to the people who live therein. This soul world is the home of a risen humanity, the place where man commences his future of life and conscious existence on what is called the spiritual plane side of being where he commences to unfold the latent capacities of his nature to a grander degree than e'er he could while living here below. Though before this can be done, many things have to be reckoned with. The evils of the past have to be dissipated. Superstitions that have accumulated about the person have to be purged from off the nature of the individual. And to accomplish this, something of pain and trivial must necessarily be endured by all concerned. It is the greatest mistake to suppose that merely because you enter into the soul world that you are then prepared to receive all the wisdom and manifest all excellence. The path of the student is difficult. There is no royal road to knowledge, and whatsoever the soul gains and values the most is always attained with the greatest effort, and sometimes by the deepest suffering, the fires of the suffering are among the potent elements that reveal the jewels of your character. So in the spiritual world it may be that in passing through the periods of trials and purification, the soul is gradually moving onwards to brighter and better things, and gaining in strength and beauty by reason of its suffering. Death works no great chance. When at first you enter that soul life, it may seem to you there is very little difference between that life and the world you have just departed from. To all appearance, people will seem much the same to you. The outward circumstances of their lives will have strong marks of similarity. The general conditions of the world itself will be so similar to the general conditions of the world from which you have departed that you might almost think that you had fallen asleep in the country on earth and had awakened in another. Yet this remarkable similarity is a wonderfully beneficent providence upon the part of the eternal wisdom. For if the translation from one world to the other involved a sudden and complete change and alteration in conditions and relationships, why then so a sudden change would result? Excuse me. <sighs> would result in such a shock to the consciousness that, in all probability, people would be seriously affected by the suddenness of transition and its resultant consequences. Divine benefits thus works to meet the requirements alike of the meanest and the greatest of humanity. For when the average individual awakes and finds himself surrounded with scenes somewhat similar to those with which he has been long acquainted in the world he has left behind, the shock is lessened, and he feels how natural it is that he should be living in this new world. And he says, It seems to me I have been here before. I am familiar with these scenes and people, and really, it is a natural place for me to be. And there is something of truth to this superstition. In the hours of sleep, when contained slumber has enclosed the outward mind and sense, the soul is sometimes awakened to the glories of life beyond, and has then caught faint glimpses of its beauty and mingled perchance with its people. Therefore, when he comes to the soul world, indistinctively at first but gradually disclosing itself, he recognizes that the familiarity of the world around him arises from the fact that he has seen and known it before. He actually became a permanent resident therein. The spirit world is suited to our needs. He enters then into a world that is in every suited by its nature to his needs. At first, the character of the chain seems but very unimportant, and hence it is that we always say, though sometimes our statement raises some dispute, that from the actual fact of death, in the first instance, there is but little or no change in the character of the individual. But after he has resided in the soul world for some little time, he realizes his condition begins to understand that the old standards of determining a man's position do not apply with the same force of his new state. Then he begins to realize that the social life, shall we call it, of the spiritual world rests upon different foundations from those of the social life of the world he has departed from, the, from and instinctively he begins to understand 
that he will very soon drop into that place or plane or association that his interior spiritual development entitles him to occupy. Then the difficulties of life start to assess themselves. What at first seemed plain sailing and easy going, what at first gave him confidence that the wicked were not punished and made him feel he had cause for secret congratulation, which made him say, Hey, you see there is no hell, no devil, no vengeful God to punish, no burning lake of fire, there is nothing to fear, as I have been taught, which causes him, for a time, to give all his remorse to the winds and make him think he is going to have a royal time over again, presently disappear, and sometime little doubt begins to obtrude itself. A little speck floats across the clear blue of his persistent pleasure, and he asks himself, I don't know, this is curious, what does it mean? Every soul finds its true level. Ultimately, he realizes that this is what it means. That is, ma that a man is are his motives. But in the soul world, the order of things is that if his secret life be solid and defiled, that he has been living here before the world, then in a very short time, he will rise to the surface of his spirituality personality, the deceit will become manifest in his actual appearance, and those who were so glad to see him, and with whom he was so glad to be, will begin to look at, at him, and he will realize something has gone wrong. He will then learn the lesson that all association in the spiritual world depends upon the law of mutual affinity and fitness, and if hath no affinity with it, and is unfit to mingle with the better sort of those he finds around him, even in the earliest portion of his career, then most surely does the law of repulsion begin to exercise its influence, and he is driven out, driven out from those whom he thought he could succeed in blinding as to the real character, driven out from those who thought he could hoodwink with his pretend and false claims. Repulsion begins to operate between them, and he is so bound to go one way, and that way is away from them. Then he begins to understand that if there is no hell and no devil, no angry deity to punish him, there is something that exceeds all these three ideas, and a something that is working within, a law of repulsion that drives him out, and that entails all the penalties that those terrene concepts have previously been associated with, and he begins to wish persistently that a hell and a devil really did exist. When a person possessing an undeveloped and abnormally con constituted mind and character is driven out to his own society, he begins to realize the fact that his own society is the very worst possible kind of society he could be associated with, and would go anywhere and do anything frequently to escape therefrom. Then begins another phase of the problem. He is now getting into hell, but the effects of this position vary in almost every case. It may result in the development of rage and hatred, or fierce and bitter strugglings within his own beast and turmoil passions, and despite his mind and thought, he will become angry, vengeful, Vicious at every stage in the descending character of these passional developments will be clearly and inevitably marked upon his features and in character. One point must be herein insisted upon. Hellish natures find their hell. <clears throat> Through these characteristics be expressed in the appearance and personality of the individual, as a rule they are not recognizable to those who live upon the same plane of spiritual unfoldment nor are they recognizable to any extent by those who are upon a lower plane of development. But they are perfectly plain and easily to be perceived by those who are above them in spiritual development. Hence, those we will see all the peculiarities expressed in the outward personal characteristics of the individual, and will see that these external manifestations represent the internal conditions, just as among yourselves the expert pognometrist can read in the alignments and appearance of the face. To a very large extent, the interior character of the individual, so that he makes comparisons between such a person and certain animals that possess certain characteristics, that this man looks like a fox and has a foxy looks, and so forth. Now it does not follow that a person has a pig's head, though he has a piggish face. So when you are told that a certain spirit have that appearance of foxes and other animals, you may take that in such appearances, but are symbolical presentations, and the spirit who is making the statement to the foraging effects, does so sincerely, no doubt, through not having a clear conception of the law of the matter just alluded to. Whereas, you should such understand, all that is really implied, all that is really implied, is an indication of the still-continued undevelopment of the spirits thus described.
Now these people we're referring to, descending into hell, they may become vengeful, moody, or active, they may brood in silence and secrecy, or they may join others like themselves, for they carry forward the dispositions they possess while living in this world, and you may find them quarreling among themselves, just as they did here below. This interpretation of their character gives you the keynote of their personal dispositions. In brief, we may say that all those who are in hell, all those souls that are living disorderly lives, disorderly life is one that is that out of a direct relationship with the external laws of progress and development, for by this progress and development you ensure true unfoldment and its consequence of happiness. Hell is a state, not a place. Disorder, then, is the keynote of the hellish of the hell world. And this disorder brings us now to the task of locating the exact place where it is. It is not carnivorous recess where murky clouds lower, and there are burning and rolling waves of fire and flame. Away from that light and glory of the day, deep bosomed in the very bowels of nature herself, where demons gnash their teeth and hurl their antimas against the goddess of God, God never made such hells as these. He had no necessity to do so. For the hells of the spiritual world are within the individual who are experiencing the results of all the conditions their actions can create. A disorderly individual, having disorder in himself, using the term in higher spiritual sense, has hell within him. As the old teaching has taught you barely truly that the kingdom of heaven is within you, so also may its opposite be within you. And this being true, Hell being within the disorderly life of the disorderly liver, that hell can never be escaped from until those who dwell within the sphere of influence themselves unlock and unbolt the bars of their disorderly living and emerge into the heavens that lie beyond it. Hell, then, is purely a personal question, and individual experience will vary in their intensity and character in accordance with the circumstances that their particular person concerned. Thus, you will understand that no actual theological hell can be found in the soul world, but instead that each one makes his own hell, and making it himself, he cannot complain against the almighty providence for giving him too much, for he creates all the experiences. Thus every cause for complaint of injustice is destroyed. Dealing with the matter in this light, we have dealt with it only in a personal application. Let us direct your attention now, to some of the hells that literally exist in actual outward from the soul world. This seeming contradiction will explain itself in a moment or two. You look at us standing by your side, with astonishment you say, this cannot be hell. See those towering mountains that rear their purple domes into the azure hues beyond? See those glowing colors that bathe the whole scene in radiant beauty? Behold, those magnificent flowers, those graceful trees, those streams like silver threads winding among the green grasses that wave and roll on their pleasant banks. See those charming lakes? Surely these are not the adjacents of hell. But those noble indifferences lifting their symmetrical domes heavenward, those stately men and women, those youths and maidens, those children, they are not devils living in hell. Why? How can you call this hell? How can you say they are devils? There must be something wrong here. The picture is too fair and lovely in this character. Surely you must be wrong. No, we are not wrong. All this is, can be seen by you there. But question one of these inhabitants and ask him what he sees. You observe the finesse of care upon his brow. He is sad, subdued, and sullen. There he is, he a terrible look lurking in his eye. A latent answer to seems to be slumbering within him. Oh, this place is a horrible place, he answered. See those towering walls, bleak and dark as the eternal granite? Look at these stagnant streams. They stink in one's nostrils. The air is full of vile odors. The very trees are stripped and bare. There are no blossoms. Look at these people. They are hateful, and I loathe their presence. Oh, if I could only get away from here and be free again, how happy I could be. <clears throat> Everything has beauty for those who may see it. What is the case of the obliquity of vision, which so changes all these transcendent glories we describe a moment since? The difference is this. You look through eyes unclouded. You look through your better thought and nature while he sees but through his own disordered, demoralized thought and feeling. The fairest flowers do not attract his gaze. The verdant hills and luxuriant valleys 
and bare and brazen, the trees are stark and naked, the musical and crystal streams are but tuprid water. When the mind is unattained to the beauty and glory of nature, and the harmonies of God, that all of being is bare and bleak and dreadful, your fellow creatures seem like foes and vile. People in this condition are mentally and spiritually and demoralized for the time being. Out of order with nature, and out of a relationship with God, or as you would say, psychologically insane, and see existence not as it is, but in the fight of their own perverted states. Reflection, however, at last penetrates through the obscuring mists of their disordered minds. Why are they here? The spiritual life is a natural life. The soul world is for everyone and all. Why did they come here? They ask themselves the answer is that they are brought there unknowing to themselves by a power superior to their own in being. They are literally held there. How so? Some things in the spirit world are done much better than they are done among yourselves, and this is one of them. Sometimes the absurd idea of the liberty of the individual is carried to a great length among yourselves, and result must disastrously, for it is not right that the untrained and the ignorant and the vicious should have the same absolute liberty and freedom in the community in which they move as the virtuous and the good. This is a problem we suggest to you for your own consideration. You have to protect yourselves against them, and that protection carried one step further might restrain within the well definition of limits, and make you realize the fact that those out of relationship with the best conditions and the best form of human society should be legitimately strained by those wiser and better than themselves. The exalted ones are the watchers over the hells. In this very hell, we are speaking of this law holds good. The wise and the philanthropic spirits, the great and the good, through all their tributary and subordinate agencies, exercise control. They bring in, from one time to time, men and women, youths and maidens, within whom they seem the possible development. This sprouting to life, so to speak, of their several natures, they are brought within the, the magic circle, shall we say, within the spiritual sphere spiritual sphere belonging to this locality the general influence of the protecting minds makes a wall around this place that these feebler wills are utterly incapable of passing through they meet a barrier what it is they cannot tell but they are conscious of a superior force the character of which they cannot define there they are kept until this sphere of influence gradually penetrates their thoughts and infuses itself into their minds stimulates their moral character and quality, and develops their latent possibilities into action. Then as the mind becomes orderly, as the soul comes into right relationship with the spiritual surroundings that belong to it, in this place where they are, behold, they begin to see sunshine. Blades of green grass begin to take place in barren soil they have seen so long. The very trees begin to put forth their leaves again, and the turbid waters seem to move with a quicker motion. Little by little, the beauty of the scene begins to unfold itself. You may take it from us that the more of the beauty you can see in your external surroundings, the more, more of the beauty there is developed within yourself. So as these disorderly minds become adjusted and reduced to due relationships of the conditions with which they are surrounded, behold, their mental and moral natures begin to assert themselves, and their institutions and aspirations begin to make music in their happy souls. Little by little they begin to realize that the hell in which they lived was a great sanatorium, a great health college, where under sultry moral influences they have been gradually brought out of the hell that the disorderly conditions of their past life created within themselves. All the hells are training grounds. Thus, the hells of the soul world are educationally, reformatory, spiritually, and morally hygienic, so to speak. Those only are brought to them in whom it's seen in the harmonies and germs of goodness are beginning to sprout, and these being thus treated are, by degrees, brought into active relationship with those who instruct and surround them. Their special adaptations and qualifications are discovered, and they are in time transferred to other educational places, where these qualities can be nourished and developed into healthy inactivity. Thus, from the lowest hells spring forth angels we shall deal with next. Before leaving the hells and their inhabitants, there is another peculiar point we would like to impress upon you which concerns the souls living therein. For in many cases, they appear to grow worse after they have passed into the spiritual world. 
you must remember that there is in every one of you a certain amount of disorder, disease of body, obliquity of mind, perversion of the moral conscious, all of which are potent elements of evil and wrongdoing. If you cannot exhaust the germs of these things while you are living in this world, if they are not expelled by the superior moral faculties and intelligible spiritual development while here on earth, then you will cling to your mental sphere and effect their outworking when you get into the spiritual world. Do not, though, for one instance, construe the argument that every man has so much wickedness, therefore he has got to be wicked to get rid of it, and thereby excuse the wickedness of yourself or your neighbor. Nothing of this sort is here involved. There is this possible misdirection in you all, but it is true and legitimate expulsion, and through developing more and more of the spiritual attributes, which is your duty here. If you do not get rid of this possible element of de degradation while here, then it will have to exhaust itself in the spiritual world, and apparently it will result in becoming much worse after death than before. The end comes at last. The period of reaction inserts itself. At such time, such gentle brother from the one of the great benevolent brotherhoods who have charge of these hells we have just mentioned, is able to take you unconsciously to yourself and place you in front of one of these sanatoriums we have portrayed, and in the end effect of your purification, but come with us to your fair senses. If possible, though, surely we may say, this sense is fair enough, for wherever the doing of the good to your fellows is involved, there shall we find beauty and sweetness, and something akin to the beneficence and love of God himself is there. Even the heavens are adjusted to your growth. We come then, to what, for convenience sake, we call the fair senses of the soul world, where the souls of men are supposed to be basking in everlasting felicity, where eternal sunshine reigns supreme, where happiness, pleasure, and joy are perpetual. Yes, you will say, one would like to find such things where true, one would very much like to discover such things after death. If we could only enter there and enjoy all the beatitudes of such a condition, how happy should we be for the change? At first, you will not find such things. The everlasting and eternal sunshine is a dream that we do not think you will realize for ages yet to come. The alternations of joy and sorrow, of shade and sunshine, of hope and fear, of success and failure, are necessities to the immortal soul for ages yet to be. And in these heavens there will be no one uninterrupted by the glowing day, no uneasy tide of joy, no unvarying sunshine. The soul has to grow. Man has to advance step by step and gain experience. Experience brings knowledge. But while he is gathering knowledge through experience, failures and disasters are sure to assail his progress from time to time. Therefore, the heavens will not be altogether devoid of their cares and anxieties, shall we call them, not altogether devoid of their aspect of gloom. Yet, because of the germs of sweetness and order and beauty belonging to him, it shall make these as fleeting shadows pass across the path of human life, only as a fitful cloud briefly shutting out the golden sunlight. What shall we find in these heavens? What do we mean by heaven? As hell is within, so also is heaven. It is no more to a locality than hell. The sense of order, peace, and righteousness consequent upon well-doing within the breast makes the place of heaven and in the societies and fraternities, families and associations of the soul world, the pure soul lives in sweetness bounds of unity. There, in that happy estate, you shall find all that in the souls of men's desire, all their hopes realize, all their affections bestirred to you, and all their aspirations unfolded to the point they have reached. Growth from stage to stage. What shall be the evolutions that arise from the heavens and the hells we have just referred to? For one might truly say that heavens are the evolutions of hells indeed. When we take life right through, in every case do we find that each ascending stage is an evolution from the stage that preceded it. What then is beyond these heavens? When the minds and souls of men grow strong enough, they plume themselves for flight to higher regions, and the conditions of disorder and inharmony disappear from the realms of belonging to their existence the plumes described. All shall then be in order and harmony and peace. And on the other particular plane of spiritual existence, we have been detailing, there shall be in body within yourself all the latent possibilities that will then become actualities, the essential principles being thus embodied within the consequences of those who live upon the plane of life. 
the old. The old heavens shall be rolled away as a scroll, so to speak, and those who have lived therein go to a higher state still, where still nobler elements of spiritual life shall be evolved. For what you have reasoned upon, what you have thought upon and experimented upon, the preceding stages shall then become actual and positive knowledge that shall be plain as clear to you as the simplest of the simplest things among yourselves today. Then shall the soul unfold new powers, new qualities and orders of actions, new and stronger associations shall arise, and over you shall all prove the consciousness that there is a mightier than thou, a deeper than that which hath yet been revealed or done, a grander than even you have yet dreamed of in your search for the mystic words of the wisdom. You desire to find the deeper foundation yet undiscovered shall bubble up with the renewed force and power within your souls. Whatever you but do and dare for the greater truth as you did and dared for the radiance and glory of the heaven that you now attain, then shall all feuds be strained, all hatreds of the mind be quenched, all the discords of affection be stilled, all the differences and distinctions that ever kept humans' lives and loves apart be banished forever, and the great family of humanity shall become one spiritual brotherhood of happy and united souls in the more real soul world that lies far, far beyond the conditions of the soul world that we have just been dealing with. Thus, briefly, we have devoured to place before you the quality of character of the hells and heavens and the evolution of possible greatness and grandeur in yourselves. The conditions of being that will meet you after the master first conditions the soul world into which you enter immediately following departure from your visual existence. Each soul experience corresponds to his internal growth. Thus discord and harmony, as you will have learned, are the keynotes of the hells and heavens of the spiritual existence. And the lesson we wish to enforce clearly upon you is that the divine providence has not made one condition or state bleak and barren, and wretched and miserable for those who are unhappy in darkness and misery, and another condition of divine beauty and glory for those who are moral and spiritually progressed. But that the soul world, like the natural world, is a bright and beautiful world in every department, and that you see and interpret its character through the medium of discord or harmony that resides within your own breast and within manifested in your own mind. Take this lesson to your heart, and then you will realize that as your own character and development, so will be your interpretation of the condition of existence in which you happen to be situated. Now let us withdraw from you this fair world to the realms of the mortal beings again. Leaving its glory and its beauty as memory, bright and pleasant to the linear within your thoughts, coming down from these brotherhoods, these families, these fraternities, from these noble philanthropic hearts, so that you may begin the practical dwellers in the mortal life, and as curtains roll behind you, as you retire from the glory that lies behind them and again tread the terrestrial fields, and remember, but a thin veil hangs between yourselves and that world from which in mind you have now returned. If you wish to enter into the calmer heavens over there, see that heavenly conditions are unfolded within your life and breasts while you are here on earth. Remember also that surely you shall find an entrance into the hells that lie beyond as a consequence of the good discords in your natural states now. Strive then to reduce all discords to harmony, purify yourselves from all unclean thoughts, desires, and deeds, lift your natures up to the highest plane of personal application, morally and spiritually, live so purely before the world that like the brightest silver, if but a breath rests upon it, it vanish here the stain can fairly be said to heaven and be seen. Keep your heart so purged, your soul so pure and sweet, that no stain can ever rest upon them. And when you die, when you pass through the mystic portals into the soul world beyond, then shall you be fitted to enter in some of its heavenly associations by having a heavenly condition already developed within yourselves, and that shall immeasurably assist you to come under the influence of greater and grander evolution than we have suggested as possible for the inhabitants of the soul world and beyond.